Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witness of it. Exalted to the right hand of the Father, he was received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. We've done late early church revelation, and then now we're doing early early church with Acts. And we've been looking at how the witness of the apostles, witness of the early church is the foundation of the Christian faith. And the witness of the apostles is their connection to Jesus, them living the life, living up the, uh, living and testifying to the life of Jesus, to his death, and then of course to his resurrection. So that's what makes these apostles foundational for our Christian faith. So we saw that kind of in the, in the first two chapters. And then last week, which Michael preached on, was Pentecost. It's the big, um, one of the big Christian holidays that we celebrate. It was also a Jewish festival at the time. And we notice, like, right, the tongues of fire that come down and they fill these people with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they have this ability to speak in all these different tongues. And they have this ability to spread the gospel to people of all nations, tribes, and tongues. And so this is kind of the context, is this setting of Pentecost it's kind of the context for Peter's um, sermon, or as I like to just call it, Peter's polemic. Because he 
in some ways pulls no punches. I mean, he is very direct with this group of people about what he wants to deliver and the message he wants to deliver to them. And so this is kind of the direction I want to go in this morning. So we'll look at Peter's exhortation or his polemic, if you want to call it that. And then we'll look at the, uh, the conviction of the crowd and then the adequate response. Um, so hopefully, hopefully you have a Bible or access to it electronically because um, we'll be looking at that a lot. Um, I don't have a lot of them on the slides, so hopefully you have it um, with you. And if not, share with a friend next to you. Um, okay, so first point. So Peter's <clears throat> exhortation. So this is really like a response. It's a response to the previous verse in verse 12, which is the crowd that is, so you had, you had two types of people, right? In the previous verse, verse 12, you had two t different types of people. There's one that was amazed at, and it's not in our text, but if you see verse 12 on your own, there was one group of people that was amazed at the works of the Spirit that was being done through these believers, the ones that were getting the Holy Spirit. And then you had other ones that were mocking them, that were saying, oh, these people are probably drunk because they're acting, probably all acting crazy. They're all saying a bunch of um, weird things. And so this is what actually what Peter is responding to. So he's responding to these skeptics. He's responding to these people that are doubting whether the Holy Spirit is really, uh, really actually working through these people. So that's the first thing to kind of note here. And then the second thing I think to note is is to look at how Peter says, listen to me. So he, he says this a few times, but he kind of begins by saying, hey, listen to me, verse 14. And as I said earlier, one thing that the writer of Acts, which is Luke, really, really wants to make clear is the authority of the apostles, that these are men that were chosen by Jesus himself to be leaders of the church, and as scripture says, that, that uh, the, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So these are men of authority, and these are men that, ha that can speak with authority. They can speak with the same type of authority as the, the scriptures, which at the time, the scriptures would have been the Old Testament. And it's because these men were specifically witnesses to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As we saw last week, uh, Matthias was chosen because his qualification was he had to be chosen, right? Because he was a witness to the resurrection. So these are people that they're not just willy nilly, you know, like credentials. These are people that actually witness a real event that took place, a historical event that took place. And because of that, they can be trustworthy. They can be trustworthy to be foundations of this faith. And so that's what gives Peter this credential here. And so he responds first by saying, and Elo, I really appreciate how you read this, because he kind of has a sarcasm. Peter has a sarcasm. Like, it, these people aren't drunk because it's only the third hour of the day. In other words, it's morning. Like, that's like, that, it's essentially this time. So these people can't be drunk. You know, they're not drunk because this isn't the time when people really get drunk. You know, it's not nighttime, they're not going out, or it's not five o'clock, or whenever the bar is opened in Jerusalem. And so he, he, he quickly responds with this kind of like witty sarcasm, that it can't be that. But then he kind of just plows right into a very serious explanation, and he points first to the prophet Joel. That's where he takes that first quote from. And so he's saying this isn't drunkenness, or supposed drunkenness. This isn't just a bunch of you know, people just like blabbing on about whatever they want. This is people that are fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy from long ago because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so in other words, this is not a farce. So Peter points to the Old Testament. So he, he, appoints, he points to an authority in the Old Testament to say that, hey, this, is, this event that's happening now is because it was prophesied long ago. 
this is a real work of the Spirit. This is a real work of God. But then he doesn't just end there. But he kind of, he continues on his polemic. Again, he's, he exhorts them saying, hey, listen to me, if you see that. Jesus was, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was crucified at the hands of man. And he, if you notice, he says that twice, verses 23 and verses 26. And of course, by our gospel accounts, Luke, John, Matthew, and Mark, they all talk about Jesus being handed over to the Roman authorities, right? So we know that, they're, that the Jewish high priests were the ones that handed over, right? So in, in a way, they were directly and indirectly responsible for the death of Jesus. But, they were, but he was handed over to these Roman authorities who actually enacted it. These are these lawless men that Peter's talking about. But this person, though, Jesus of Nazareth, he is not just Jesus of Nazareth. He's not just another man. You see, like, I think today, 2,000 years post-Jesus, I think it's pretty universally accepted that when you think of Jesus, we at least associate with him with the, the, the Christian belief, which is him as God. And whether people believe that or not is another story. But people today generally make that association. Oh, Jesus. We don't think of Jesus of Nazareth, right? We don't say, like, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, he's our God or our Lord. We just say Jesus Christ or Jesus. Because we, 2,000 years later, have gone through history and theology and doctrines and biblical studies and universally pretty much accepted that Jesus is God. But for the time, at this time, that was not the case. They did not see Jesus, this person, Jesus of Nazareth, necessarily as the Christ, nor did they see him as God. They didn't see him as the Christ, Messiah, or God, Lord. But he was, just a, he was just a historical figure. He was this guy, a carpenter, son of a carpenter from Nazareth. Nothing super special about him, but he made all these wild claims, and he was eventually crucified at the hands of the Romans. So this is kind of the view that they had of him, and especially for these early Jews, who did not accept him as the Messiah. They didn't accept him as the Christ. And yet Peter is saying that this guy that you crucified, this person that you witnessed, this person that lived among you, this person is actually Lord. And you see this in the quote from Joel. This goes from Joel 2.32. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. And that Lord is Yahweh. So he's putting Jesus in the status of Yahweh, which for Jewish belief, biblical belief, there is only one God. There is only one name that is above every name. And so putting Jesus in that position of divine authority is the first thing that he does. And then he says that he relates him also to Christ, Psalm 110 which he also quotes from. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So he's exalting Jesus of Nazareth to this position of the Christ, of Messiahship, of the person who's going to come and bring deliverance to Israel, the person who's going to fulfill the Davidic kingdom. And we also see that he is sent by God, verses 22 and 23, that he was sent forth by God according to the appointed plan and foreknowledge of God. So again, he's not just a guy that popped up on the spot, but there was a plan that long ago, God had a plan to send him forth to do something. And all the proof is in the resurrection. So then Peter uses Psalm 16 to show how David, who... Um, who is a man who is dead, right? He says, we know the, where this dude's tomb is. We know that this, this text isn't talking about David because this dude is dead. But it's actually talking about Jesus. It's talking about the resurrection. That David actually prophesied about this resurrection happening in Psalm 16. And we are all witnesses to the resurrection. And so here's another proof text 
of how Jesus is the Christ, how Jesus is Lord, how the Old Testament prophecies spoke of this occurrence, of this thing happening. And so the result of the resurrection then is the outpouring of the Spirit. And you see how he's, how he's building his argument here. And so in summary of kind of, of this point, in summary of, of his initial exhortation, is that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of prophecy, so the fulfillment of the prophecy from Joel. And that was made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus was crucified because of mankind, one, because of man's sinfulness, but yet at the same time, it was part of God's plan. God's plan to conquer death. And because Jesus was resurrected, he was literally unable to be held by death, it says. He is God because of his immortality. And because he is alive, because he couldn't be held by death, his spirit then is poured out. You see that. So because he couldn't be taken down by death, his spirit then is alive, and his spirit is able to be poured into his people, into all who call upon his name. And so you see how then he's building this argument and saying, because Jesus resurrected, because this man, Jesus resurrected, is the reason why all this stuff is happening. And that is all the fulfillment of prophecy, fulfillment of the scriptures. And so then into the uh, next point. So then the conviction of the crowd. Again, this is the crowd. This is the group of people that initially was mocking. This is the, the, the group of people that were skeptics, the ones that were doubting whether the people filled with the Holy Spirit, that these tongues of fire that it's spoken of is actually a real occurrence by God. Peter, again, pulls <clears throat> zero punches, and he goes right in with them. You see in verse 37, then having heard, then they were cut to the heart. So they, in, it's, it's a response to the imperative of Peter to listen in the previous verses. So Peter's previous <clears throat> exhortations to them, to listen, listen to what I have to say to you. Now is their response. So then, then having heard, they were cut to the heart. So they're hearing, truly hearing and listening to what Peter was saying brings about this piercing of the heart, if you will. Or they were cut to the heart. The truth penetrated into their heart, deep into their heart. Slicing all surfaces, all the way to the, the depth of it. And they were cut to the heart because they realized what they had done. They realized that they had crucified the Son of God. You see in verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. So he is, he is cutting in, in deep. And so they're realizing that this, this dude, this carpenter, we crucified him. He is Lord. He is the Christ. And it's not because there was a shortage of evidence. Because they were all witnesses. We know this. Peter says it. Attests to it. It wasn't just an ex like They didn't just need an intellectual exercise or a philosophical exercise. But they needed something radical. They needed a radical change in their hearts. And they realized in that moment that their hands were stained with the blood of God. That was the cutting of their hearts. That's what brought about that conviction in their hearts. That this person was not just another person, but this person was God himself. And our our hands are stained with God's blood, and we're responsible for this. That is what they realized. So then the response, the adequate response, if you notice what Peter says, just repent. 
repent. Their reaction, the crowd's reaction, was not to cover themselves, if you notice that. What do they say? What shall we do? What do we do about this? They don't say, what can we, what can we bring to make this better? Um, or they didn't justify themselves. They didn't try and make excuses to say, well, we didn't really know, or we didn't really have enough evidence to whether this guy was really, um, was really God or not. Or they didn't try and weasel their way out. But they simply responded with, what shall we do about this? And Peter's response, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will, too, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this occurrence, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of the prophecy, you will get that through Jesus Christ. And it is through that repentance, that repentance piece, is where that comes about. For this is a promise, as it says. This is a promise that is for you and for your children and all who are far, far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. And notice that he says, repent in the name of Jesus Christ. This isn't Jesus plus something else. This isn't Jesus plus bring your religion or your self-righteousness. But this is Jesus alone. In Jesus' name alone shall you be saved. In Jesus' name alone, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And so for these Jews, just imagine this. For, to for the Torah, for Jewish law, this would have, for murdering any man this, or woman, this immediately would have resulted in the death penalty for them. And then they double this with this being God. So imagine the, the, the heaviness and the weight in their hearts of thinking about what they just did. Like, we didn't just, we thought we killed a man rightly, but we didn't. We actually murdered him. And we didn't just murder a man, we murdered God. We murdered the Son of God. I mean, that is like annihilation on the spot. But what's the response? Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. You see, it's, repentance is an inner change. It's an inner change of mind, of heart, and of will. And that will actually changes our actions. This is what they needed. And this is all that God actually asks. This is all that God actually requires of us, is repentance. Nothing else to bring to the table but just repentance. And that was made possible because of Christ's death. Because Christ gave himself up to take away their sins. They no longer need to bring anything to the table or to sacrifice something or to do something in order to make things right. Repent. And so I think the question for us is how do we regain a heart of repentance? Because it's not that we need to be resaved. Because one, you know, once we are saved, we are in God's family. But I think we go through periods where our hearts are hardened to the truth, or our hearts are, are hardened to affection for God. And so to be continually transformed into the image of Christ, we need to have this heart of repentance or this heart of change, this heart that changes to the image of Christ. And I think the answer in part is in verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You see, Luke doesn't separate, or um, Peter doesn't separate those two sentences. He didn't separate those truths. He keeps them together. And why can those two things go together? That God 
in his plan and his knowledge, sent forth his son to be crucified, and yet he was also crucified by man. Why can those two things coexist? Those things can coexist because God's the one that is initiating it. That while we're responsible for it, while we're responsible for indirectly for the death of Jesus, that, that in order for us to be in a right relationship with God and for our sins to be covered, Christ needed to die. He needed to be the ultimate sacrifice. That God was willing to do that. That he, in his love and mercy and grace for us, wanted to do that. That was all part of his plan. And that is why we can simply respond with repentance. Because Christ already did all that work for us. In Luke in the book of the Gospel of Luke, he, this is what Jesus says. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And in Hebrews 2.20, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, that is us, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Christ's suffering makes our salvation perfect possible and perfect and complete. And when we are realizing this gospel truth that while just like these very, very early believers that the offense that they had, the murdering of God was completely paid for with repentance, because of what Christ did, because of what Christ did on the cross in covering their sin. And so for us, it is the same. It is the same. Now, we don't have literally God's blood on our hands, but we still have the, res the responsibilities of sin that we, that we take part in every day. And yet the response on our part is the same, is repentance. Because all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's realizing that. Realizing how God's grace is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And that it really displays our shortcomings, our brokenness, the ways we sin and mess up. Really display how beautiful God's grace is. We are... Our brokenness is highlighted, highlights and glorifies the beauty of, and grace of God. And I think when we sit in that, when we realize that, is when our hearts begin to change. And I wanted to just close with this old hymn, Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray.